Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's not actually afternoon. Good morning for, for most of you. Uh, my name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to our program today, uh, which is Improving Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Scholarly Publications, a panel discussion. And today's panel is sponsored by ProQuest. Um, I would just say today's uh, discussion is one in a series of webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, products, and developments of, of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a couple of features of the webinar software. Um, for all of you calling in today, please know that you should be automatically muted and your cameras should be disabled. So don't worry about generating noise or feedback that should be all taken care of for you. Um, in the main area of the screen, you should uh, be able to see our, our brief presentation materials. We will not have a whole lot of slides today since it's a panel discussion, just uh, a slide introducing each of our speakers. Um, we are also using the Q&A feature today. Um, so please use that to ask any questions that you may have of, of our speakers today. Um, our audience today is large, so we may not be able to get to all of the questions that come in. Um, we will get to as many as we can, uh, so drop them into that Q&A box as they come to you, um, and we will do our best to get to them. Um, please also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. If you want to toggle that on or off, um, you can use that little CC button in the bottom right corner of your screen. And also note that we are recording today's program and that everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to that archive version. All right, as far as front matter goes, that's um, about as much as we need. So I will um, move right on to allowing each of our panelists to say just a, a few words about themselves. Um, and if we could move on to the next slide there, that would be great. Dr. Lady J, would you like to introduce yourself a bit? Hey, everybody. I am Dr. Lady J, and I am really excited to be on the panel today. Uh, I've had a really great time meeting everybody that we're going to be talking with today. And um, the reason I come to this whole thing is, you know, my background in creating something that is trying to represent voices that have been outside of academia was when I came to academia, uh, drag was all about gender theory, um, things like Judith Butler. And it was all about kind of like what the act of cross-dressing signified in different ways on stage, off stage. But the reality that I saw being a performer in the drag scene and like as a huge mega fan in the audience was that like, that's kind of like reducing architecture to bricks. It's, yeah, there's pieces here that, that are relevant, but that's not what happens on stage. That's what happens before stage, if anything. It's not like when drag performers get on stage, they're thinking, how woman am I being right now? They're telling a story, they're creating characters. That's what we do, um, or an endless number of other things. But that's kind of why I came to this was because I thought, you know, this art form, there's an intrigue of it with academia, but there's not a firsthand knowledge and experience. And there were a lot of people who would be like, I did drag and so now I understand drag. No, you dressed in drag for an evening. That doesn't make you part of the culture, doesn't make you part of the performance world. Like those are different things. You played around in my world. It's like you picked up a trumpet for a night. That doesn't mean that suddenly you're a professional trumpet player and you know what it's like to survive in that world. And the same thing goes for drag. And so that's kind of one of the biggest things I noticed. And the other part that really upset me was that like most of the narrative was always generated by cisgender gay men. And so there was often this idea that when trans women were part of drag, no matter whether it was 150 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago or now, that would be problematized every time. That would be turned into an issue or a monstrous um, kind of grotesque version of how drag distorts people instead of understanding that like drag is how many trans people find themselves, including myself. Um, and so I really was like, you know, why is it that we understand that when we look at 19th century sexuality models, we say, okay, there's not a gay culture. There are sexual inversion models and all these different things, but 
then we say that's part of gay history that's not part of trans history. So there's kind of the disconnect that I see when I would see people who would be performing on stage and off stage and living their lives as women who were born assigned male. And so this all comes kind of from my activism and my lived experience of being a drag performer, being an Appalachian, um, and starting off in activism as an environmental activist, and then kind of doing that also in this, because I grew up around coal and radioactive power. Uh, and so what I'm working on now is drag reading and viewing lists uh, and free and open drag history classes that I do from a lot of different uh, places. And the biggest thing that I'm getting to do right now is I am working on a drag college curriculum that we're hoping to create scholarships for at Studio West 117, which I'll talk a little bit more later about, um, which is this new LGBTQ plus hub where I'm going to be building sort of inclusive programming with equitable pay and diverse casting. Um, and that all kind of is how my career came out of academia and research, but ended me up in a different kind of place where I get to put all those things to use. So that's me. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, and up next we have uh, Parnesha. Would you like to say a little bit about yourself here? Thank you. Um, I appreciate you that being uh, able to participate on this panel and to meet uh, what I hope will be lifelong resources with everyone here um, contributing. I, I started out in uh, publishing and uh, I was 22 years old and I started uh, at Third World Press in Chicago, which is the oldest now uh, black publisher in the country. And so, you know, in kind of keeping this short and sweet, I, I mentioned this on a, a previous panel I was on before about, I kind of entered this arena um, and entered publishing through marginalized voices or what are considered marginalized voices or voices don't, that don't necessarily, that are not necessarily at the forefront of, of publishing. And so I really didn't, I didn't necessarily um, think that it was out of bounds or thinking outside the box or even thinking it was special to publish the unheard voices. I thought that that was just a natural part of being curious people, being people of excellence, being decent human beings, is that we want as many people to have a seat at the table. And so coming in through what is considered the non-traditional way of publishing, the non-traditional audiences, book markets, authors, all of those kinds of things kind of set me up when I got to Northwestern, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, wasn't obviously the most colorful or, or what, what we think of in terms of marginalized voices on the list. But at the same time, I, I wasn't scared of that idea. And I didn't think it, we, it was something out of the norm. And so what I have, been a part of at Northwestern is identifying what already made it diverse and kind of building off of that and learning from that um, with my colleagues and the books that we published in the history. So my job, I feel in the last now uh, almost 18 years that I've been at Northwestern, I've moved from marketing assistant to now the director of the press. And so I feel like I've touched every part of how we make books, how we put content out into the world. And I feel like I've touched or been a part of every type of audience you can think of in sharing your knowledge and your books and, and what we do. And I just always feel that thinking outside the box should not be treated as a specialty. Publishing so many different types of voices and voices that we consider marginalized. I, I am working towards this not being a big deal anymore. I'm working towards us not necessarily having to have panels and conversations about why it's important to publish diverse voice, voices or marginalized voices. I think we will truly be onto something when this is no longer a topic of conversation, debate, or panel. And so that's what I work towards in what I do at the press, what my colleagues do so well at the press, and that's the trajectory we're on. Excellent. 
Thank you so much. And Roberto, if you'd like to say a, a few words here. Sure. My name is uh, Roberto Delgadillo. I am a student services librarian at the University of California, Davis. Uh, before I embarked on an academic career, now a little over 15 years ago, I got my start as a librarian working for the Inglewood Public Library in Southern California. And in all that time and since, and you know, uh, whatnot, experiences, past, present, and hopefully future, of course, one of the things that I've noticed is that regardless of library or situation, that one of the things that I aim for in wanting to draw, uh, whether you, you refer to them as library patrons, users, in the community or whatnot is to, and it informs basically what I try to do every day, uh, is to embrace, embrace difference to cultivate knowledge. Um, and what that basically means, as I point out, that, you know, when I look back at my background and journey to what I do, is to, at the end of the day, I always try to help cultivate this joy of serendipity. Um, and what I mean by that is that one of the structures that helped me adjust to this country because I am originally from Nicaragua and I arrived as a, as a young child seeking medical assistance in the aftermath of mine having contracted a bout of childhood polio in Nicaragua and the, the kind people that were kind enough to bring me here were the, uh, the Shriners. Uh, they, they ran orthopedic hospitals in, in my particular case in Los Angeles. And so that's how we came to arrive in 1979. And, you know, at the time uh, when I arrived here, you know, everything was just bewildering, not just language wise, culture wise, but, you know, we had no sense that we were going to remain until unfortunately the civil war was to break out shortly thereafter. And one of the things that I learned as soon as I was able to well, quite frankly, I wouldn't say read immediately because it, it does take a number of years, especially when there are no bilingual structures set up, was in fact a library. So I could go there and spend time and, you know, kind of lose myself in there. And what I grew to like after a while um, was, again, this sense of discovery. Every day I was learning something new, uh, whether it was in the murals, the books, and it just gave me a sense of comfort, and it's something that I always try to replicate every day, not only as a librarian, but in others. And certainly with a lot of the changes that we've been going through, not just the last four years, but the last year in particular with the challenges posed by COVID-19, it's all the more important to try to do this and think of those particular ways with which to do so with the challenges of COVID-19 in terms of at least conveying this, this, you know, since we're unable to do so in person, obviously, uh, doing this via, you know, the, the format that we work under here, in this case, you know, with Zoom or, or whatnot. Um, so in terms of, you know, when I am able to go back or what I have been able to continue doing in terms of, you know, via Zoom is to kind of continue those outreach efforts that I had already established. And one of these is something that I, <laughs> shamelessly stole from a fellow librarian uh, who recently just became, you know, last year, I believe, uh, you know, one of the recipients of the I Love My Librarian Award, Jesus uh, Alfonso Regalado at, uh, at SUNY Albany, and he gave it, he had a great outreach uh, program called Latte with a Librarian, where you just, again, you know, at times for me, it's not so much to discuss over library resources, but to think about the ways that you can approach the library and not only from one point of view, embrace the library and what it is as a space of affinity or a community hub, but also if it turns out that you need help with your research, you know, we are there in that, you know, certain position. So it just speaks to me of those things that I kind of always, you know, am always wanting to embrace, which for me is, you know, outreach, 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 and it's just, I'm of the opinion that whether it's for you know a faculty member, staff, or student, that it's just not enough to have a once in a quarter BI session or a bibliographic instruction session with the students. And so you always kind of want to look out for those opportunities to, you know, academically or socially or whatnot, push for those partnerships and other bodies where 
again, you aim to represent uh, the academic community or even the community in general, just outside of it. And such. All right. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Roberta. And and last but not least, we've got Salman here. If you'd like to say um, a little bit about yourself, that would be excellent. Hi everyone, <clears throat> uh, my name is Salman Hussain. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at University of Michigan's Anthropology and History program. Uh, my dissertation research is on the social lives of uh, Pakistani migrants to the Arabian Peninsula in their home city, Sahiwal, which is a small city in Punjab province of Pakistan. Uh, my dissertation ad addresses migrants as social actors in their home cities rather than just absent remitters, which uh, uh, has been uh, remittances has been the focus on a lot of scholarship. Um, but uh, my dissertation uh, addresses them uh, as social actors and focuses on what they do when they return uh, um, intermittently or after they are done working. Um, my research interest spans class, gender, transnationalism, and small cities. <clears throat> my interest in migration stems from my own journey. Uh, I grew up in Pakistan, in fact, the same um, uh, small city, uh, which is my field site now. Uh, and I moved to the United States where I experienced firsthand the life of a tech worker, uh, my, mired in visa regulations and financial obligations, and uh, caught in a vice like uh, sponsoring, visa sponsoring employers uh, grip. Um, this part is important because uh, the migrants to the Gulf, uh, uh, they, their lives and um, uh, livelihoods are structured, and so is their transnationalism, structured by the particular conditions of uh, their uh, work visas. Okay, so return to returning to my own journey. Um, being a Muslim migrant in the US in the aftermath of 9-11 added another layer to my experience. Um, I had to make sense of the world I found myself in. Uh, this is me uh, as a tech worker in a paper company. Um, uh, and I had to, I started reading <clears throat> on my own, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, and became a sort of an autodidact uh, and I, uh, <clears throat> looked for um, uh, a lot of uh, scholarly content on the internet. Um, and um, thanks to uh, formats like LiveGen, which has gone through several uh, mutations since then. Um, and there was an underground uh, internet economy of uh, pirated PDFs, <clears throat> academic work from several disciplines. So academic books sometimes have this throwaway phrase at the back of uh, uh, the cover that uh, announces that uh, this book uh, is also for um, uh, the general reader. Uh, however, it was apparent to me at the time that uh, the author uh, or the ecosystem of academic publishing at large did not believe that this general reader existed. Um, the language uh, was crafted in such a way that it was uh, there was a layer of inaccessibility. Uh, some sometimes the price is like ninety five dollars. Uh, academic article is thirty five dollars or forty dollars or whatever. I've never paid that price, um, so I don't exactly know. But we're familiar with that. Um, so there's these kinds of issues of accessibility, and uh, it's just taken for granted that uh, only an enrolled academic is going to read this work, um, whereas this public and education remains like um, uh, a mission for the university and for our uh, us as academics, uh, you know, the, the two things don't gel together. Uh, this yes. is when I came across uh, Chapati Mystery, uh, a blog uh, about South Asian histories and cultures um, that also commented regularly on American politics. I was invited to join this uh, collective uh, and have been with them uh, for 10 years. Um, their uh, two recent PhDs kind of took me under their wing and um, uh, uh, kind of sneakily uh, 
planted that idea uh, in my head that I should go to grad school, um, which at the time, um, this was 10 years ago, sounded like a good idea. Oh, I will get my PhD in five years and I'm done, but here I am. Um, so I left my software development career and joined uh, University of Wisconsin's uh, Urban Studies doctoral program. And three years later, I migrated, migrated to my uh, present program at Michigan. At the University of Michigan, I have organized a series of storytelling events called uh, Migrant Stories. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm taking this emphasis on uh, uh, migrant narratives uh, into my uh, own research. Um, um, uh, however, uh, because, I mean, I can't get, really get into uh, uh, what happens uh, in the Arabian Peninsula to migrant workers, uh, and, but there is- And Salman, I'm gonna jump in and, and ask if, if Maybe you can wrap yeah. up after this thought. Thank you. Right. Um, so basically, to cut the story short, um, uh, uh, a part of my dissertation is to document and theorize uh, migrant worker workers' engagement with their home state, uh, Pakistan, uh, and with each other through digital media. And we can talk about that uh, in the follow-up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for going long. No worries. We'll do our best to, to keep things moving. Um, so for folks out there um, listening in, we're, we've got, I've got a series of questions for each of our panelists, um, a couple of questions apiece, and we're just going to move through those from here on out. Um, as I said, please, if you do have questions for anyone on the panel, drop them in that Q&A box. So our first question um, today is for Dr. Lady J. Um, and it's simply, of course, simply right. Uh, what challenges did you have finding scholarly information related to your dissertation topic? Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I have a lot of things to say about that. I did wanna jump off of something that someone said a second ago. Um, one of the main reasons I wanted to write about drag as well was because I noticed also this imagined reader who could understand this language. And I, I was constantly frustrated because I was like, most drag performers I know are not people who have access to a college education, much less access to a graduate level education. And like, this is literally not how we talk about what we do. This has nothing to do with how we talk about what we do. And I was like, you can't start theorizing stuff that you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's been. You don't know where it's going. You don't know how to talk the language. What are you doing? You're just making things up. And I was like, it's very interesting commentary on gender. It's not good commentary on drag. And like, that's one of the things that really pushed me. I came to grad school originally to write about women in country music because I'm from the, the foothills of the Smokies. So that's what I was gonna do. And then I realized I had this perspective that was unique and, and I brought this background from drag. And that's when I ran into the difficulties with the resources. So I started looking into things beyond just Judith Butler or Marjorie Garber's vested interests and things like that. And you're like, okay, there's a lot of cool things here. There's little pieces I can pick out, but I can't, still don't really know what the history is. What's the narrative? Like, where did drag come from? At least the version of nightlife drag that we have today, which there's a million different stories of how drag develops in theater, how drag develops on film, how drag develops in nightclubs, how drag develops in sex lives. Like it functions in a million different ways. And so all those things kind of have their own history, but I was like, you know, we at least need the broken, some kind of something to hang something on. So we have some idea of, of what we're contextualizing things within even. And so when I started looking, I was like, okay, so how do you build a strategy for building a history for this? And I said, okay, well, I started off thinking I'm gonna do a hundred years of drag history. I was like, that's very quickly, that's impossible. So then it was like, okay, maybe from 1960 to now. And then I kind of narrowed down to, okay, what if I answer this one question and then let that do everything else? And it was, you know, I came into drag because before the world of drag race, I came up in the mid nineties, early two thousands. And like, I was exposed to, to Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar, um, Priscilla, the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, um, Mrs. Doubtfire, The Birdcage, 
RuPaul, all of these things kind of exploded when I was a kid. And then I found them on VHS and DVD when I was in high school and middle school. And they changed my life as a rural kid who didn't have a word for being trans or being drag or being anything. And they, I was like, that's, I don't know what life's supposed to be, but that's it. And that kind of shook everything up. But I, again, didn't like, I was like, how did this get here? How did this find its way to me? How did these movies, it feels like there's just this big explosion in the 90s that came out of nowhere. And people kind of go, yeah, Paris is burning, RuPaul, Jenny Livingston, uh, Madonna's Vogue, and kind of write it all off as just this thing that happened because the AIDS crisis was a moment where people came together. And I was like, it's, it, I think it's way more complicated than that. And so once you actually start to go, okay, what are the scenes that came together here? Then you find out, okay, there's this London new romantic scene that's developing in England. And there's like people who are drag performers who are board, becoming performance artists. They are legitimizing drag in the, like the Dauphé gallery, like big famous, like legitimate art galleries. Their drag is popping up in like the world of rock and roll in places like the Mud Club, Club 82, like um, all of these different kind of Studio 54, uh, Maxis, Kansas City, all these things that are so significant to the history of rock and roll, drag was right there, it wasn't peripheral. It was absolutely crucial to what happens in rock and roll in the 70s. And that, there is a direct lineage that comes out of that. But so what I'd start doing was going, okay, if I can just start finding figures and places and dates and just start putting those on a, on a board. And then eventually I'll kind of start to see how things connect. And like one of the things that was really helpful was going, let's look at what the performers have to say. And like some of the books, this was like the first book that I ever completely had a panic attack of joy when I found. It's called The Drag Queens of New York, an illustrated field guide it's by Julian Fleischer. And it's obviously a non-academic source. But what you find is there's a conversation between all the performers and the interviewee that goes along the bottom of the whole entire book about what they do, how they feel about these movies coming out, what their involvement was them, with them was, how many of them were actually in some of these films. Um, but then it also does this weird thing that drag queens didn't have a great language for how we categorize ourselves that we shared until Drag Race. Drag Race has done a lot of damage, but it did make it so we go, ah, that's like, that's a pageant girl. This is like, you know, the spooky queen. This is the like club kid. Like we became able to say, this is pointillism, this is cubism. Like we developed a way to identify what our art is and how to talk about it. But what you see in this book is like the first struggles of people's trying to understand these newly emergent forms of drag or resurgent, because some of these started in the 60s. But like they create this scale of like clown to glamour that's under each of the performer highlights. And then some of the people like break the scale. And I, I love seeing that like, oh, this performer literally just doesn't fit in any of these boxes. And like, that's okay for the book to acknowledge as well. And then tracing, where did these people come from? What theater troops were they involved with? Going back to Klaus Nomi and Joey Arias showing up on Saturday Night Live with David Bowie. Like that is drag, all of that, those are all drag performers. Those were all people who came from the drag scene and they're often categorized as just performance art and they're not connected directly to the scene they developed in. And so like, and, those are the kind and, of things that really found valuable. Excellent, and Dr. Lady J, I'm sorry to jump in and and, and cut you off a little bit, my apologies. Um, but I would, love to, I would love to hear a, a bit from Parnesha as well. Um, so for you, Parnesha, Dr. Lady J, um, describe the process of finding resources and building those connections. Um, and, and representing diverse communities. Um, as a publisher, what challenges do you face when it comes to supporting and publishing authors from diverse backgrounds and identities? So I will say, um, you know, the, the biggest thing, and I think that there, there was actually a, a question that I think that came in through the chat, um, also kind of uh, in, in the vein of, of this question that you're asking, I'll just start off by saying that the main challenge, I think, is convincing people that there are markets for diverse communities or the communities that are not necessarily um, have been published. I think the biggest challenge is convincing that um, these are marketable communities 
these are books, there are people out there that want these books that they actually sell. And, you know, to, to kind of play on this a little bit and get a little bit more specific. I mean, now we, you know, in some ways it's, it's kind of in, in vogue to publish people of color, to publish more um, black people. And I, I'm happy to see these things, but at the same time, I, I worry that these are not, these folks and these new band of authors that are coming in are not gonna be fully su supported um, because traditionally um, the markets where we put books don't necessarily go towards the markets that you know these folks represent and occupy. There's an incredible documentary, if you all haven't seen it, it, the Toni Morrison documentary, The Pieces That I Am, I think very much speaks to um, obviously her as a brilliant writer, but I, I love this documentary so much because it talks about what she faced as uh, an editor, um, what she faced as an editor at uh, Knopf. And, you know, she was responsible for the likes of, you know, Angela Davis and Muhammad Ali's biography, those different things. And so it's the challenges, I think, there are always going to be challenges whenever you publish. There's always going to be challenges of you want the book to perform well, you want it to be out in the world, you want as many hands and eyes on it. But I think speaking specifically to this and your question is a lot of the challenges actually come from within. It's actually getting on the same page about what this book, what this author needs when you finally get to that other side of publication. And so it's not necessarily, I don't always look necessarily of how we're gonna get these books in the hands of readers or to the libraries or to the scholars. That's actually the easy part of the job. It's from within, it's getting everybody on the same page of being, being conscious and being aware and being knowledgeable about something outside of our own bubble. When we bring these voices in, they have to feel confident that we know what they're doing and that we understand their books and we understand where in the world they want their books. So to answer that question, I would say start from within. And if you get on the same page and your team is on the same page and you're very realistic and honest about how you understand this book, how you understand the art, author, understanding the possibilities of the markets and where this book could possibly go. And it's not gonna always be traditional ways. I think you can pretty much handle on when it does actually get out there. Excellent, excellent. All right. And so for our final question in this first round, um, we have a question here for Salman. Um, and Salman, we've, uh, or actually not our, not our final question. We've still got to get to Ro Roberto as well. Um, but I'm going to go a little out of order here and, and, uh, ask to Salman. <laughs> um, well, maybe I won't. Um, sorry about that. Uh, as a librarian for you, Roberto, <laughs> to, to stick with the flow of things, because it does make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, how do you respond to students who are struggling to find those resources, those relevant resources? Um, from the often overlooked or perspectives other than those that are considered mainstream. For example, students who are facing the challenges that Dr. Lady J described during her research. So how do, how do you get those in front of the, the people that need them? It's just that actually. Um, in my experience, I encounter students that are so in their minds have set up this structure or think along the lines of, Oh, I've been assigned to find materials that are, you know, peer reviewed or that only can only be found in the rules of Hoyle databases. I cannot consider anything that's outside of what academia has deemed, again, to have passed the proverbial mustard in terms of saying so that, in essence, if you don't find it in an academic library, then it's not subject to something of, of interest. And a lot of things increasingly are sometimes they will steep into the realm of say, popular culture or those areas that are sometimes viewed as, well, that's not academic. You know, what do you, what is really, what is it you're trying to get? 
And instead, what I point out is that when it comes to research, that you know you have to think of it, you know, viewing it from a different lens. And the challenges that sometimes occur are those things that Dr. Lady J, Pernicia, and others here have mentioned, which is that sometimes it is very much ensconced in this academic language that just seems so impenetrable. And so that in some cases, some of the students that I encounter will often, in essence, regurgitate that which they're looking for without really understanding what it is that they want. But they feel as though, oh, I, I kind of want to, you know, talk in the same lingo, the same approach that my professor is saying. And, and if anything else, it just discourages them because they realize that, that in some cases they're not, well, in essence, prepared to come across that and that they're really putting efforts toward wanting to learn something that doesn't really exist. And so what I tend to do is, you know, first of all, identify, okay, what is it that you want and where have you looked? And when you have looked, now that we have looked at where you have looked, now let's look at other areas where you have not looked. Be it, you know, through the use of advanced Google searches, YouTube, other platforms that most people think, oh, I did not know that YouTube could be or is the site of oral histories, film examples, other formats that to them, they would have thought of, oh, this does not quite meet the characteristics of what is to be, again, a rules of Hoyle work of academic work. Um, and so that in some cases, they're just out there. You just have to break that mindset, if you will, of, of them thinking, oh, I, 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 can't, I can't pursue or look into that particular aspect of research because no one has done it or, or this approach is vastly different. And the thing is, is that no, someone has done it. Someone, it's just not the way, it's not the way that you're, you're expecting to find it, but it's there. And if anything there, the trick, if you will, if I, you know, if I can reduce it, perhaps it shouldn't be reducing it so much so, but the challenge rather is just where can you find that framework, that template that you have used for something else and then apply it to your question, your research study. And there you will find those voices, those experiences that you then say, oh, hmm, no one has in fact looked at this. And if they have looked at it, then the other challenge you then face is that, oh, someone already talked about this. Oh, it, never mind then, my, my effort is done. My old advisor once used to say to me there, and he also used to simplify things, sorry. Long story short is that he would say, when it came to research, there are three things. You can prove it, disprove it, or prove it or disprove it under a new framework, which no one had ever looked at before. That's it. <laughs> and a librarian can help and others can help, you know, help you find that. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Roberto. Um, and as uh, I sort of previewed, we will move right on to, to Salman. Um, and so, Salman, um, we've heard for now from, uh, from a, a publisher, a librarian, uh, about their efforts to provide access to resources from diverse authors, their perspectives on that. Um, for you as a graduate student, what has your experience been in finding relevant scholarly resources to support your research? Uh, well, I'm glad I'm uh, going right after Roberto, uh, uh, and I'd like to follow, uh, uh, you know, in the same uh, vein um, uh, and talk a little bit about the diversity of uh, sources that we as scholars uh, should be attuned to. Uh, we, as in, you know, we graduate students need to be attuned to or and the wider community. Um, so I'm a contributed uh, editor to the multimodal anthropology section of uh, American Anthropological Association's uh, flagship journal, uh, the American Anthropologist. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of uh, putting together uh, um, a, 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 a publicly available forum uh, uh, that uh, on Indian Ocean that draws on a multimodal approach. Uh, this multimodal approach kind of like uh, came 
to the fore as uh, the pandemic hit and uh, people were kind of grounded uh, uh, and um, my discipline anthropology is uh, uh, kind of heavy on um, the traditional method of going to a field site and being there. Um, so, um, I mean, there is this, uh, uh, as Roberto was saying, uh, students have uh, um, a, a kind of sense of uh, not uh, taking uh, a YouTube video as uh, uh, a, a, a vital commentary. Uh, and that might have something to do with um, uh, thinking of uh, um, you know, uh, digital media content uh, as uh, an inert so like data source and not uh, something uh, that produces insight uh, on its own uh, because it's not stated in the language, uh, as Roberto was saying, the academic language. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, um, uh, specialized discourse that's produced by specialists for other specialists uh, is uh, necessary for furthering knowledge and understanding. And I'm not like dissing on academic language. Um, yet this sort of uh, this specialized discourse and uh, producing it, uh, it doesn't stand on its own unassisted. Um, um, there is a political under uh, economy undergirding scholarship where uh, academics are, uh, we do all sorts of, uh, we have to do all sorts of uh, different kinds of uh, writings to, uh, you know, first uh, enroll into uh, a school, um, uh, get grants for our research. Um, uh, all of this uh, um, uh, goes into um, uh, our work, uh, and then uh, we have to be out in the world, uh, you know, collecting our, our research data. Um, uh, after that, uh, we may produce, um, you know, a journal article or a university press uh, book, which then again, uh, you know, includes convincing uh, journal or university press. Uh, now, in all of this, what gets ignored is, uh, you know, um, that we have to kind of make it more accessible. Uh, if I think that I've produced uh, a significant insight, I want it to be popularized. Um, and um, uh, even this way of thinking that uh, it tells us that uh, in my mind, the, the, the flow is unidirectional of going from this specialized discourse out in the world. Uh, but this, it's a loop, uh, uh, you know, uh, from lay folks to uh, the scholars, uh, thinking about something. The idea is not just born in a disembodied head uh, of scholar, it comes from uh, all of these circulations. Um, so, um, and Salman, can I, can I ask you to wrap up here with maybe yes. one last thought? Right. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, um, I think uh, the multimodal approach uh, is, is well suited for what I've tried to uh, articulate here, uh, except uh, with one caveat that we do not think of it as simply a research tool or an inert tool with which to data uh, to gather data. Uh, but it's also uh, a place to draw inspiration and insights from, even if it's not produced, uh, the material is not speaking that specialized language. It's, it's a source of uh, ideas. It's a source of inspiration. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so to move to you, Pranisha, um, earlier you were talking um, about some of the challenges of publishing diverse authors. Um, and you mentioned that it was sort of an, an internal thing. Um, so it makes me wonder when you're publishing sort of non-traditional um, formats, things like translations and those sorts of things, I imagine that there are financial considerations that, that come into it as well. Um, so are there ways or, or when you're publishing these sorts of uh, works, how do you secure funds to support DEI in publishing? 
So it's, it's such a great question. And I think that, you know, I'll start off by answering that it's going to be a question that will be, um, the answers are gonna always evolve. There's not gonna be one set of answers to um, answer a question like this. We need to, in trying to answer these questions and moving forward as publishers, we need to have a great deal of empathy for ourselves as publishers to know that this is gonna be an ever moving target, so to speak. And so the answers are gonna change and evolve. I think that you know one of the things that we've started um, definitely looking into is, you know, as a scholarly uh, publisher at Northwestern, one of the questions I initially asked was, well, we asked, I'm used to, because I was the editor for the trade side of the list versus the scholarly side. And so I started to ask the questions of, well, I don't understand why we don't ask trade authors for subventions, just like we asked the scholarly authors. A lot of our trade authors are connect, connected to organizations and institutions, which will probably be the number one source for supporting their books. So we talked about things like that, like you should have the same type of requirements in terms of funding, in terms of support on the trade and scholarly side. So that's one of the things that we've looked into of, you know, when we're ready to, you know, strike that deal with an author, if they have certain organizations or institutions that they're connected to, to ask if they would be willing to support the book and provide some type of subvention. And usually 99% of the time, they're ready and willing to do that. So that's one thing that um, we do. The other thing is looking at the power of special sales and non-traditional book markets. Um, I feel that that is, is something that constantly gets overlooked. We looked at, we look at obviously, okay, we know it's gonna to go to independent bookstores. We know it's gonna to go to libraries. We know it's going to um, go to uh, the retail market. But now we have to actually, and especially I would say in these last couple of years of just looking at what the publishing industry is, not just from a commercial standpoint, but from a scholarly standpoint, a lot of our books as a scholarly publisher um, cross over into the commercial world. And so, we have to take, look, take a look at what is the given market, but what are also the special markets for each, each individual um, um, book. And usually that can match the sales of anything that you do in the retail market or, um, and what you do and accomplish with library sales. So I think looking at non-traditional ways of putting a book out in the world, looking at non-traditional, um, markets, and usually you can answer these questions if you sit down and talk with the author. We start to do a complete, what we call almost a background check of the authors with their AQs. That's like the most important thing that we ask of the authors is to turn their AQs over because we internalize who they are. It's not just putting their book out in the world. We're, we're putting them out in the world. They are the biggest representative for their book besides us. And so when we see that they're connected to certain organizations, when we see what they've been doing out in the world, aside from just writing this book that we're publishing, those are usually the very direct targets and marketplaces that we want to know about um, this book. So really stepping outside of what is the given of publishing a book and finding those um, specialized markets and then it's always, I always answer a question like this to say, have you been out in your backyard lately? Been out in your backyard lately and with us, basically going to the departments, the organizations on our very own campus, they are ready and willing to support books through you know, virtual in-person book parties, adopt for classes. When we have books that are part of series, I always ask the series editor, are you adopting this for your, your class since you know, you're part of this whole thing? It's always have you stepped out in your backyard and, and do you know what's out in your backyard is usually one of the best places to put a book out in the world. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, looking at the time and the vast number of excellent questions that we have in the Q&A, um, I'd like to, to take a little time to make sure that we get to them, uh, those questions that are coming in from the audience. 
Um, so if that's okay with folks here, yeah, we're getting some nods, great. Um, then I will turn things over um, right here for the Q&A to Linnell, I believe. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm actually, oh. Linnell is busy answering the Q&A. Um, so to Michelle then. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly ask this. So we've had a lot of these questions come in, um, several of them directed to Roberto, and um, several people have asked this, and we were hoping you could answer. Most often professors, including myself, um, the person who asked the question, discourage students from using non-scholarly work, namely non-peer-reviewed. Are these non-academic sources, like YouTube that you mentioned, um, authenticated by well-known entities outside of the academia? And do you get pushback from faculty? Uh, in the instances where I have, I remind that in some of these instances when looking at YouTube videos or whatnot, they often are associated with institutions. One of the areas that I tend to help students with is around the area of Chicanx Latinx studies. And some of the research involves the use of oral histories and transcripts. And increasingly institutions are not, and especially all the more so with the challenges posed by COVID-19, we are seeing institutions load, if you will, these transcripts, these oral histories, whatnot, available. So in a way, it's the institution that's loading them. Now, this is not to say, however, of course, that, yeah, you're not going to find, you're going to find stuff that's a bit questionable and not obviously going to fulfill the needs of what is being asked of it being, you know, or as I said before, the rules of foil peer reviewed material. Um, but increasingly, you are finding, as I said, not just through YouTube, but through other non-traditional academic platforms, those materials, which would have basically the, the stamp, the imprimatur, if you will, of an academic source. So for me to see something from the University of, say, you know, Texas, Austin, where they have loaded oral histories of the work of the Percero program, or the experiences of migrant workers, and or the immigrant experience elsewhere, be it from Europe, parts of the United States or what have you, that that would fit there. They're not, you know, attitude is one, of course, it fulfills their needs of wanting to get their name out, if you will, but also it does serve a need for making those materials available in a way that maybe they hadn't been done before. And so that's, that's how I kind of, uh, you know, would address that. If that helps. That does, thank you. Yes, um, we have a lot more questions coming in. Um, this one is actually directed to pretty much all panelists. So feel free anyone to, to jump in and answer this. Um, the question is um, that the, the, the attendee would like to hear more around the general challenges of whiteness and the patriarchal culture norms, which we have in academic publishing. And how can DEI authors better break through and have exposure in spite of these still underlying, not so conscious tendencies of the academic publishers in force? So it's quite a long question, but um, if anyone has any ideas or would like to answer that, please jump in. I have one thought. Um, you know, I'm not super interested anymore in where I'm at my career in publishing in academic journals. Um, but there was a time in my career before I graduated and before I decided I wanted to work in a non-traditional kind of way that I was very interested, like the end goal was Journal of, Journal of American Musicological Society. And so the editor, they got a new editor, they came to Case, uh, my grad school, uh, maybe, maybe three or four years before I graduated. And they sat down with all of us graduate students, it was, she did, and uh, I apologize, I cannot think of her name right now. Um, but she sat down with all of us and had this conversation about how she wanted us to submit and yada, yada, yada. And then honestly, sometimes you should just be confrontational with people because what we all did was say, do you want us to publish in your journal? Because by the, what you put in it, it seems pretty clear that you do not want us to publish in your journal. I don't see anything that looks like what any of us does. So please stop saying that or live up to it, one or the other, but don't, don't keep pussyfooting around and acting like you want this new research and you want these new ideas and you are thinking your journal is a little dusty and that you want to shake that up unless you're going to do it. And I will say to their credit, 
I have never pursued them, but like they called me to do their a book review last year, which I was surprised about because I was so confrontational with them. But sometimes I think people value right now actually being challenged instead of people kind of feeling like you have to hem and haw with everyone if you can find a way to wedge a privilege in there. And like, that's kind of one of the things that I feel like as a graduate student who's trans and does drag, again, people who generally in both categories don't have much access to these kind of institutional moments with people. Um, that's my job was to say like, either live up to it or don't. And, and I'm seeing that sometimes, not always, but sometimes people do respond. I'm shaking my head only because I remember my experiences as well when I was finishing up with my with my doctoral degree that everything everything had to be fit in the box, you know, with, with what I was studying. Is it, you know, the question always going through my mind was, does this fit gender, race, or class? Does this, you know, is the Holy Trinity? We used to joke about it in the, the graduate lounge. And increasingly we would get, you know, we would hear from professors or is in your case, you know, editors who said, oh, this particular episode of Nicaraguan history needs to be acknowledged. And then all the while you're thinking, who's going to read it? No one's going to read it. You know, no one's going to, you know, especially if you want me to crush this in academic language in a way that doesn't make sense to, you know, to other folks. Because by this time, by the time I was finishing up, what I was, you know, and I say this uh, to folks, you know, I actually had fun writing my dissertation in the sense that Towards the very end, I said, you know what, I'm going to write the way that I want to. I'm, like, I'm going to abandon the third, you know, the passive voice, the standard language. And as well, as someone put in the questions here, the college educated white American vernacular English. That's absolutely correct. I said, you know what, gone. I'm going to, I'm going to save my history. I'm going to, you know, just make it fun. Approach it the way that I want to. I don't care if it fits gender, race, or class. If I happen to touch upon that, cool. If not, I'm out. You know, now I just want to make sure that how can I fit that and how can I tend then tie this in to other episodes of history, you know, that hadn't been noticed. Because by the time you're done, when you're looking at that one little slice, you're just thinking like, what in the world are you talking about? This is so, so divorced. And my affirmation of sorts was one of the times when I went back to Nicaragua and I was talking to someone, you know, that I had recently met. This person was talking about my dissertation, but in a way that was non-academic and it was hitting all the points and I kept thinking, there, that's it. This is it. This guy, this guy does not, you know, by where I come from, you know, just got out of high school, no graduate degree, no, nothing that I had, you know, growing up through this Americanized educational system thinking like, oh, Clearly, this person won't get it. Nope, hanging out right there, not, not a problem. That's when I realized, you know what? I made the best decision after all. Amazing, thank you. Um, we have just a few minutes left, and so we've got time for one more quick question. This one is for Panisha. Uh, do you have any stats you could share about the percentage of scholarly work being published now that comes from marginalized voices? at your press or just more in general? This is a conversation that they frequently have with students. So that's an amazing question. And I would prefer to um, actually not answer it in the idea of stats, but to talk about some of the folks that are doing this work and have been doing this work a long time. Northwestern obviously is one of those, uh, one of the publishers that I have always been committed to publishing things like translations we have an incredible um, array of series, uh, Critical Insurgencies, which is in, um, in conjunction with the Critical Ethnic Studies Association. We have the Drinking Gourd Chapbook Prize, which publishes a, um, uh, a pu publishes a chapbook by a writer of color. We have the um, Kaveh Kanem Second Book Prize, um, which is really one of the only um, poetry book prizes for uh, a black writer or of the black diaspora that focuses on their second book. Because if you are an author, you know that it's just as hard to get your second book published as your first. 
And so we started a second book prize. We have the Buffett Global Humanities Prize, but there are publishers um, who I just greatly admire that have been doing this work for a long time. If you look at the folks at the University of Georgia Press, um, if you look at uh, NYU Press, which has a series, uh, several series that focuses on sexuality and gender and race. It, Duke University Press is one of the biggest university presses that publish on race and gender and sexuality. So it, it's, if I tried to put it in stats, um, it's not gonna be accurate, but I will say that there are presses, especially scholarly presses that have always been on the front lines of these particular areas and actually are connected to organizations focused in these particular areas. So all you have to do is just, you know, play the gamble and look up some of, you know, our brightest in terms of the university press and scholarly community. What's even more wonderful about it is, like I said before, they're connected to organizations already doing this work and book series are created out of that. So the stats from at least a scholarly standpoint are, it's, it's quite large in what the presses are doing and the books that they're bringing to the forefront. Excellent, thank you so much for that, Parnisha. Um, I would just jump in here to say that we um, have come up to the, to the end of our hour um, and would just say thank you so much to each of our uh, speakers today to Roberto and Pernicia and Dr. Lady J and Salman. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in this discussion. It's a really important one. Um, and we, we appreciate the time that you've put into thinking about the questions um, and providing information for everybody here. Um, I think the questions in the Q&A coming in speak to how much engagement there is. Um, and how interested everyone is in this topic. Um, so again, just thank you. For those folks out there joining us today, I would say thank you for doing so. Um, and if you have just a second before you sign out here, um, there should be a brief survey that pops up on your browser. If you could take a minute just to fill out uh, those four or five questions, that would really help us out and we would really appreciate your responses. Um, so once again, thank you to, to our speakers and we, uh, and to those out there, we look forward to hopefully seeing you on another program in the near future. Thanks very much.